genre. In the world of Hollywood, movies get greenlit and redlit. They get remade and rebooted. But we are the ideal. I'm Sam Gash, and you are listening to Ideal Remake. Thank you for listening to Ideal Remake. We take movies that either have been, will be, or should be remade and talk about what the ideal version of that remake would be. Now, we may record this episode. Maybe not. But me and my friend are going to go buy some Aerosmith tickets. Top priority of the summer. So, Ray, is Dazed and Confused a movie that has been, will be, or should be remade? This is a fascinating question for a Texan. I think... (laughs) I think a lot of people would say no if you're from Texas, but... I think a lot of people haven't been touched by this film, so I don't know, maybe from somebody from California it will be. Like, they, they just <laughs> find it charming, so they'll do something like this. So if we were breaking this down as, like, some sort of duo, which one of us be, would be dazed, which one of us would be confused? Um, I'm for sure confused. Cool, then I can be dazed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or whatever, I guess. <laughs> Hi, Ray. Hello. Welcome to Ideal Remake. It's lovely to be here. So, because I forgot to do this before, and I'm not going to forget uh, now... Why don't you take a moment and introduce yourself to anyone who might be listening? Sure, yeah. I'm uh, Raymond Helvig. I'm a screenwriter's assistant out here in L.A. It's fun to be here. Thank you so much you for having me. You say you're a writer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm also a writer, but, you know, certain things pay my bills. <laughs> I mean, look, writing doesn't pay my bills either, but I still say I'm a writer. That's fair. That's fair. But yeah, cool. So we're watching Dazed and Confused. Do you remember the first time you saw this movie? Oh, man. I had to have been... But probably aptly, I was like 15 in high school, probably getting just as stoned as they were. (laughs) That's that's probably the right age to see this movie. Oh, absolutely. But like, do you remember like anything about how or why you first saw the movie? You know, that was the time period where I just had a bunch of film friends in high school and we wanted to watch young teen rebellious films and this, I guess, kind of foot the bill. And then being from and shot in and around Austin, Texas, like... I mean, it was a staple. It's, it's what you did. You watch Dazed and Confused with your buddies and you get really stoned. <laughs> so since you're, since you're from the town that this movie ostensibly takes place in, yeah. how much of it is based in reality? <laughs> in in the, you know, 2010s, uh, I, I can't say that I saw a whole lot of it. But no, the, the vibe is there for sure. <laughs> Austin is definitely like a hippie stoner town with that's a not bunch even of the part i was referring to i was referring to the part where the se- the outgoing seniors go and paddle the incoming freshmen i mean there there's there was hazing back when i was going through you know middle school to high school i don't know if paddling would have been accepted but you know there was some of that i mean it's interesting <laughs> that i'm coming off of dazed and confused and i'm going to answer ask this question and i will answer it too have you been hazed I have been hazed, but I, I was in a I was in a theater fraternity in college, so it was a very light hazing. It was it was like, hey, we're gonna come into your house and we're we're gonna tie you up, but we need to make sure that like you're okay with it. We're gonna blind, it's gonna be fine. We're just gonna like tie you up, and then you're uh-huh. gonna go on a scavenger hunt. Like yeah. that was our hazing. Mine was for the uh, the theater club in high school. Nice. <laughs> I also got the theater version of hazing. Theater version of hazing for high school for Catalina Foothills High School in Tucson was we had to design our own shirts and then like we wear them and then like we go through and it's it's initiation and what we know going in is that it's basically this theater club you have to work on or be in a certain number of plays to qualify for this experience and then we go through this experience and some people get in some people don't and some people say it took me this number of tries that number of tries And so I get there and they had blindfolds for all of us, but apparently I have a large head and I was the only person who the blindfold didn't fit. So what I ended up doing and they kept apologizing was I took the shirt off and tied it around my own eyes. So I'm walking around shirtless. Now my idea for the shirt was I just drew a kid in a spotlight and then I had everyone in the theater department sign the back. Fantastic. Which I still have that shirt. Big fan of that shirt. So good. And I don't remember what any of the challenges were. None of them. (laughs) But I remember I did not get in. You went shirtless and you didn't get in? Yeah, that whole process and whatever happened in like the different competitions and whatever. And I didn't 
that's, qualify. That's a crime. It I'm pretty is. sure. <laughs> and then they said psych, everyone got in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it was like one of those things where it was like, and they, they, I took a couple of them, I talked to them afterwards, and they were just like, you in particular, you're not getting in. And we could just see on your face how devastated you were. <laughs> and it broke us. <laughs> and they were just like, we felt so bad. And I was just like, because I was like doing the trying so hard not to cry kind of yeah, smile. they made you go shirtless and yeah. then you didn't get in. Well, only to get to the stage and then I put the shirt back on. What a messed up participation trophy that was. <laughs> right. But anyway, we've all been hazed. We've been through it. We've yeah. lived dazed and confused. It's of a course. thing. But yeah, so like... It's an interesting movie. Um, it's a weird one. Yeah, I told you the story how in the same day I watched Days and Confused, I also watched Fame. And Days and Confused is better. Oh, yeah. But the, there's still some problematic things. Oh, for sure. I put it in the same bracket as, like, uh, Licorice Pizza, I think. That's fair. Yeah. I had I didn't have to watch Licorice Pizza for the podcast, but I did turn that movie off. Yeah. <laughs> it is an adult actively trying to date a child. Thousand percent. And yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's that's weird. And that also happens in this... Well, it's a high schooler dating a, a middle schooler, which is not okay. Well, I mean, if we talk about McConaughey's character, that is a adult. Adult trying to date high schoolers. Yes. No, you're right. <laughs> How deep were we in the movie? Half hour, 45 minutes? When, and then Matthew McConaughey shows up and you're like, oh, I guess this is the movie that he's from. Yeah. And then the, uh, the movie he is from. It, yeah. The one he's most famous from and he's just a creep. He's... He's the Fonz, but worse. Yeah, his most iconic line that he's known for is... Other than, all right, all right, all right. No, it's just that one, don't make me say the other one. <laughs> <laughs> the, so the, uh, his other iconic line from this movie is, I love high school chicks, I get older and they stay the same age. It's rough. It's gross, and I have seen that on multiple bumper stickers. Yeah, here? Generally. Oh, I, I remember, I grew up in Arizona. Oh, no, that makes sense. Yeah, no. (laughs) And I've told you stories about my college that I will tell you off mic again. Yeah, the South is a time. My college was in Colorado. Uh, Which, sort of Southwest, but no. No, there's there's a lot of things I love about that city. There's also just, you know, there's dummies everywhere. Yeah, (laughs) that is true of everywhere. There are always dummies everywhere. But I think that's the point of this movie, is like, it's meant to have that very kind of weird gray area of growing up and then also McConaughey's character but a lot of it is you know it's a lot of high schoolers and teenagers trying to figure out what they're cool with what they're not cool with who they are who they are um and it gets a little dicey I think sometimes when you're trying to figure that stuff out yeah plus it's Richard Linklater and he loves a slice of life he gosh does he I mean other than Hitman but he loves a slice (laughs) of life (laughs) Yeah, that was a bit of a departure for him, but I love Linklater, obviously. I yeah. have a special place in my heart for that man. I used to go and watch um used to go and watch him put up movies at uh, this little theater in Austin. He would just have seatings. Is with he from of, Austin? He's from Austin, yeah. That he makes shoots, sense. Shoots most of his pictures there, except for Hitman. He actually I hear he might have gotten pushed out of the city because of uh, uh grants or whatever. Weird. I'm not really sure. Either way, like I remember the year that he made, the year that, not the year he made Boyhood, the year Boyhood came out. I remember genuinely being upset that it didn't win Best Picture. Not because I thought it was a more entertaining movie than Birdman. I fucking love Birdman. I love Birdman. But I was like, I was all in for Boyhood to win because like, if you don't reward innovation, people are going to stop innovating. I mean, the dedication that film took is insane. It's, it does something that like the only other things that you can say do the same sort of idea are the before sunrise before midnight whatever movies yeah where it's the same people over time and it's just like just that concept it's to the point where it's now been over 10 years and people want the next one Oof. you think they'll you think they'll do that i don't know i don't know i don't think they will Mm -hmm. but i know people want it i don't know what the movie would be about i don't either or when it would be set during the day Mm. it's before, (laughs) before sunrise before midnight what's the other one before sunrise, sunset before sunset before sunrise before sunset before midnight before dawn i guess yeah that's not a good movie about people in their 60s no <laughs> no it's not <laughs> uh, but yeah i don't know it would be interesting and i i know people want it and so like i think richard like i think richard i think richard link later did a good job making this movie like i think for what this movie was at the time that it was despite the fact that it took place six 19 no yeah 
17 years yeah. after it was supposedly set. Like, it is scripted, but it feels authentic. Yeah, it very much hits the time frame really well. But for people who haven't seen this movie, hmm? what happens? How does the movie start? Um, It starts out with a bunch of kids uh, finishing their either eighth grade year or their uh, senior year for the most part there are a few people that are in between finishing out the school year i had a weird moment where i was like this movie doesn't take place in real time no no it doesn't no that'd be crazy no no no. that's that's (laughs) only high noon and only high noon and i guess birdman but still yeah and even even then that one doesn't either but like still birdman is a time no it it, all of them graduated going into their summer some of them it's going to be their last summer there, going off to college. Other ones, other of the younger kids from eighth grade going into high school. And so it's this transitional period of kids either becoming adults or kids getting older. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them are getting hazed as they're getting out of schools. Eventually it all leads to them going to this big party out in the woods where they're sort of finding themselves in their niches and yeah. who they are. There's kind of like three core stories yeah. that happened kind of throughout one of the stories centers around pink who kind of has a hand in every single other story i don't know why his name is pink but it doesn't really matter no his story is that he gets handed a piece of paper from the foot the football team everyone else in the football team has signed it basically saying i have a commitment to not drink or do drugs because i care about the team more than anything else right and he doesn't want to sign it because he doesn't like that this football team is regulating his life right which fair yeah his last name is... He's called Pink because his last name's Floyd. Oh! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they nickname him Pink. That's great. I yeah, like yeah. that. And then... So his story is basically... Just like He's also like the kind of defender of the kids. He's the nice guy. He kind of ties everything together, knows everybody. Yeah. He's the kind of cool, popular kid who's just gener- generally friends with everybody. Yeah. But his whole arc is people keep picking up the paper and handing it back to him going, you should really sign this, think about the team. You should do this, think about the future. You should do this, do that. And he keeps being told, don't hang out with like his scummy uh, pot friends yeah. or don't hang out with these people, don't hang out with that people. And he just genuinely seems like a person who's like, I want to hang out with everybody. I don't want to be told who to hang out with. I want to yeah. have the friends I want to have. Yeah, he, he definitely seems like a dude that just wants to live. And I, you know, I think that's the whole point of his character is he doesn't yeah. want limitations on himself and he just wants to be able to experience what he wants to experience. And like towards the end of the movie, he has a line where he's like, I never want to say that my time in high school was the best time of my life. Mm. Like, I'm having a good time, but I want I want to have things to look forward to. I want yeah. to have new experiences and I want to continue to seek that stuff out. Yeah, who wants to peak in high school? No one. <laughs> well, that's not true. Uh, well. <laughs> the dude who sticks around for a fifth year, maybe. Maybe. Who it turns out yeah. was Ben Affleck. Yeah, turns out it's Ben Affleck. There are a couple people in this movie who I didn't know. Like, the only two people I recognized in this movie were Matthew McConaughey. Right. And Parker Posey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone else who was in this movie, I did not recognize. So Ben Affleck, I didn't know it was him until we got to the end credits. And it was like, and Ben Affleck. And I was like, fucking what? <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. I, I, You did not recognize him at all. No. Wow. I mean, it makes sense. He's such, like... A Massachusetts guy. Yeah. He's a Massachusetts character. So for him to be in this, obviously, a little bit more Southern setting doesn't really make any sense. Oh, he's just very young. It also never occurred to me that he had a career or a job before Goodwill Hunting. <laughs> well, I When mean, did Goodwill Hunting come out? Goodwill Hunting is 1997. That's four years after this movie. Yeah, I... This doesn't really seem like a launch out role for him. I mean, it was probably definitely... He did a good job. He did a great job. As a monster. As an absolute scumbag. But, you know, it wasn't his... Goodwill hunting was obviously his launch off sure. point. Especially that's certainly more in line with who he wants to be as an actor. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But, okay, so that's Pink's storyline. What's one of the other storylines? What's Mitch Kramer's lo- uh, arc? Yeah, Mitch, Mitch is the younger kid, eighth grader, who's going into high school. So... At, at first, we see him trying to escape with his friends in a in a brand new car that was hand-me-down to one of his friends. Escape because in a car because they don't want to get hazed. They don't the high school paddled. seniors are hazing the incoming freshmen exactly. by capturing them and then hitting them with paddles. Yes. Yeah. So they escape in a car. He just wants to make it out of there, make it alive, make it through the summer so he can get to high school unscathed. Obviously, that doesn't happen. <laughs> because he has to pitch in a baseball game and... 
he knows, and he's the pitcher. So as soon as he strikes out the last guy, he basically just, the, he, he's been getting jeered at by the high schoolers the whole game because they know where he's supposed to be. Just waiting for him. And eventually they, he just walks over and goes, all right, let's do this thing. Yeah. But it, but it go, it takes a nice turn. It goes from obviously getting hazed, which isn't great. Sure. But he ends up gaining this sort of camaraderie with these older guys that yeah. kind of take him under their wing and show him what it's like to be with the older guys, kind of giving him a legacy of what they got to go through and what it means for him to be going through high school and give him a glimpse of what he has to look forward to. It's interesting because you can kind of see a running line with his current eighth grade friends and then the high school people where he kind of runs into Pink, Pink gives him a lift home and then invites him to a party later on, which is a party that was supposed to happen at Pickford's house, but then the kegs get dropped off early and the parents realize what's going to happen so they don't go out of town. Whole thing gets shut down. Whole thing gets shut down, which is kind of funny. And I was like, I've never seen that in a movie. That's fun. I enjoy that. Yeah. Good for the parents and also ha-ha suckers. (laughs) Exactly. And, but so Mitch basically is then kind of like tagging along on all the different adventures that these, uh, these seniors are going on. Yeah. The only one that's really questionable is when they like drive around the neighborhood and like dump out trash cans and like baseball bat mailboxes yeah with the trash cans with the trash cans an interesting choice it is when the (laughs) when the you can clearly see when they're watching it like as soon as they hit the mailbox like it's clearly made of like balsa wood (laughs) and the mailbox just like pops apart explodes yeah but it it was like that was the one thing where i was like i don't know about this 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 felt out of character for pink well everyone else in the car i get it pink no but I think you could tell, I mean, Pink obviously wasn't uncomfortable with it. it Not sounds like at this all. is just something that was fun for all of them. Yeah. But, you know, Mitch was obviously a little uncomfortable with yeah. it. Yeah. Until he threw the bowling ball through a back window of somebody. Right. But even then, they immediately get their ramifications in the parking lot of getting a gun pulled on them by an older guy. Which yeah. Which is also kind of out of left field for this movie being so lighthearted. It's still Texas. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got a point. But, you know, I, I I think that there's a lot of parallels between Pink and Mitch. And yeah. I think it was obviously supposed to be set up that way. Sure. And it's also, like, a lot of, like, respectful for, like, it, it's good to have a mentor. Like, yeah. any one of us sitting and watching this movie being like, oh, man, I, I kind of wish one of, like, the older kids had taken me under their wing and be like... There's no reason to be anxious about any of this. Here's how all this is going to go. It's going to be fine. You're going to be fine. That never happened, but it seems nice. It seems very nice. I, I, You know, somebody that now does art and makes films and was a nerdy person, you don't always get that when no. you... No. Especially not from the, what, football captain? No. Of the- <laughs> I was willing to do that for the kids who came to play Yu-Gi-Oh! But oh, that yeah. was because we were here at the nerd place to do the nerd thing. <laughs> Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, that's fine. And I knew I was going to kick their ass later. But at, <laughs> but at Yu-Gi-Oh! I mean, how many people are playing Royal Decrees? They're not going to be able to use their trap cards. <laughs> but it's something we can all empathize with, I think. It's, it's, I agree. It's a brilliant little, little yeah. nugget in that film. And so those are kind of, like, the two bigger stories. And then kind of, like, the, the C storyline are these three bonus nerds. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who yeah, yeah. I have as... Who we, we have decided are eyebrow nerd, yes. pale nerd, yep. redhead lady. Yes, yes, yes. And they're like, well, we're normally just hanging out and playing poker, but I guess we should go to this party. Which, Tony, the one with glasses, that's Anthony Rapp. Who it turns out is Mark from Rent. Yeah, it just he just a long string of insane characters throughout the ages. Yeah. It's insane. This I whole cast did not is... recognize him until I looked it up later. It's truly a star-studded cast. It the really more is. More you look into it. So the, cra- the the most interesting thing about this trio for me is that it was not a love triangle in any way, shape, or form. You anticipated being that way. You do. I spent the whole time being like, which one of them is going to try to like, who is going to be upset with uh, what was the redheaded's name with Cynthia for like wanting to hook up with Wooderson? Yep. And they think it's dumb because uh, Wooderson, Matthew he McConaughey is, is a skis and he sucks. But it's not because any of them are interested in each other. They're genuinely just platonic friends. Yeah. Which is something you don't typically see in anything of this genre. I thought that was the best part of the representation of those three characters. Is yeah. just platonic friends. Yeah. Three platonic nerds that like hanging out. I mean, the worst thing about it is that Eyebrow Nerd had a chip on his shoulder and uh, picked a fight with a person he shouldn't have picked a fight with. Oh, yeah. he was an idiot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lighter Nerd 
almost hooked up with an like whatever year he was sophomore or junior or whatever was like hooking up sort of with an eighth a person who was an eighth grader about to be a freshman about to be a freshman which is not okay not great and then uh redhead didn't have a character no not at all they did not write her well at all they didn't write really any of the women well no no um which is why i made it through most of the casting and then was like oh wait i also have to cast some of the women yeah it was unfortunate but which is interesting because they did have a lot of uh female characters that were centerpieces in the film absolutely and for whatever reason they just like sabrina that the the freshman that tony is like sort of hitting on which is kind of weird she's an obvious centerpiece in the entire thing and supposed to sort of represent that female half of coming into this new place of high school and stuff and they didn't but really... she basically has no character other than being like well this older guy is kind of cute and yeah. that's it that's her character they didn't develop her at all which was really unfortunate i think that unfortunately might be a theme for richard linklater stuff is that like he's good with boys not as good with girls i think so so we've kind of talked about the movie as it is let's yeah. talk about actually before we do that what do you think are the core concepts of this movie that we kind of need to take into whatever our version is going to be? Ooh. I mean, I think there's obviously coming of age. Sure. Maybe the weird gray area of being so young and learning yourself, I, th- I think, is a seems to be a pretty big theme for Linklater in this film. I think that's fair. What else to go with? Be- well, just being yourself, yeah. I guess. I think there's another important question that needs to be asked. Hmm. When would you like to set our version of this movie? Oh, man. Because there's also, like, there's something to be said for putting it in our youth, but our youths are different. We're 10 years apart age-wise. That's true. So, like, me putting it in the 90s is great for me, but But that means nothing to you. But putting it in the 90s is also just the sequel to the film. That's the other problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's something to be said for putting it back in the 70s, but then I don't think that's as honest as necessarily we want because things in the 70s were different. That's true. Yeah, and it's it's also something that I don't think either of us would super be able to get the vibe down for. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a potential problem of setting it now because there's such a strong independent youth culture now that is so specifically recognizable. I also think that potentially time locks the movie. Mm. And despite the fact that this movie takes place in 1976, it doesn't feel like the 70s. No, it really doesn't. Like, they're not... And that might be intentional. Like, they're not... We could certainly set it now and just not have whatever Instagramified version of children are around. It could still just be, like, a neutral experience. A part of me almost wants to just double... It's such a rebellious movie in a lot of ways. A part of me just wants to say, screw it, and go earlier, just to the 60s. Oh. Just make it even more rebellious, add just a little bit more to it. I... The reason why I would fight against that... Sure is because this movie is exceptionally white. Mm. And I feel like if we want to Fair. break ourselves of that, we have to go mm. to a time... Certainly there isn't a time we can go to yet that isn't extremely racist. Yeah. But I would like to go maybe slightly less overt racism. Full 80s, go full disco with it? We certainly could. <laughs> that also might feel like a sequel, but fuck it, who cares? The, uh, the fact that the sequel isn't in the 80s... There's is a sequel? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Hold on. Uh, Dazed Is it and... called Dazed and Contused? No, it's... Oh, goodness. Everybody Wants Some. Oh. Everybody Wants Some. I feel like I've heard of that, but I didn't know it was a sequel. Oh, it is set in the 80s. So we could do 90s. Okay. Yeah. Everybody Wants Some! Exclamation point, exclamation point. Yeah. I was totally mistaken. It's set in the 80s. That's this, perfect. We could just do the 90s. This came out eight years ago. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And... It, it, this is also directly a sequel in that. In 1980, Texas, a college freshman moves into an old frat house with his new baseball teammates as they party their way through the final weekend of summer. Yep. It is literally not about the first week, the, the like, heading into high school. It's about heading into college. Heading into college. And, boy, this is what the parties are like in college. Is the... Is the... <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> that might be why its budget was $10 million and it grossed 4.6. It's... It's a film. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we can still set it in... We 
could do the 90s. We could do the 90s. It's something that you and I have a lot of nostalgia for. I, I mean, certainly, I did actually grow up in the 90s. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in a part of the 90s. I don't have a whole lot of recollection of it, sure. Well, I guess it's like, I guess the real question is, do you want this to be pre or post uh, 9-11? Pre. Okay, the 90s it is. thousand percent pre. Late 90s. We can literally literally set this in like 99. Okay, let's go. Of like, hey, can you you believe it's going to be like Y2K at the end of the year? That's actually really funny to just sprinkle in Y2K throughout it. Yeah. I like that. But yeah, something like that. (laughs) Just like, it's not, we get to have that like kind of like little bit of excitement of like, this is our last summer of this millennium. Yeah, no, I love that. We gotta make it the best one we can. Yeah, let's kick it off with a bang. Absolutely. Okay, so that's when we're setting it. And then let's say we have our, still our core, like, three stories of, like, we have the people... So was Pink a junior becoming a senior, or was he a senior leaving the school? Because he was going to be playing football the next year. So it felt like he was a yeah, junior becoming a senior. He, I think he might have been a junior becoming a senior. I think that makes more sense. Because everyone there seemed like, we'll see you next year, freshman. Implying that they were going to be a senior. Right. And it sure seemed like the Ben Affleck character flunked and was getting to celebrate his, like, because he was going to be a senior again. So he got to still be the asshole that he always wanted to be. Right. Let so he's see. the fifth year or whatever. But let's say we're doing high school. And so these kids are going into high school and, like, 1999, end of school year, big excite. Yeah. So do we want to have the freshmen, the junior, and the nerds? I feel like that third storyline could basically be anything. I mean, I I think the nerds make the most sense if we are going to have, like, a a dash of Y2K in there. I think that it'd give us some good, funny moments as far as technology is concerned. That's true. Yeah. It'd be fun if one of them had a cell phone and it's just one of the absolute clunkers from 1999. I mean, I think if we make Mike's character the the Y2K-obsessed character, uh, the guy that gets in the fight with, with that guy at the party... I think that would make a lot of sense to that, me. That does make sense to me. <laughs> well, it's also like, they also could be very much, like, it sure felt to me like they worked for the school newspaper. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And like, they <laughs> have that, that vibe, vibe of like, well, we're gonna, we gotta digitize the newspaper because like, the news, or no, even better, the newspaper is so important because like, all the computers are gonna go down and we'll need the newspaper because it's not computerized. <laughs> That's how important it's going to be. Heck yeah, man. <laughs> Can you imagine if we lose all of our save files for Oregon Trail? <laughs> when you're a vintage hipster for school newspapers fantastic oh, <laughs> but like something like that like that's kind of why like that they're so important and like part of the reason they're going to the party okay actually let's take a step back why are they going to the party i mean if they if we are going down this route of like newspaper maybe they're just trying to document everything they can or if they think the world is going to end with Y2K, they're like, this is our last summer to party before the apocalypse happens. <laughs> let's go ham. <laughs> let's, let's go crazy. Like, I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, So, like, we have to go and experience things. Like, we're only ever working on the paper. But if this is our last summer before the world ends, I want to try a beer. <laughs> I want to try a beer. Heck yeah. So, like, but I think we get to have the comedic uh, parallels of... These are some people who, like, it's presumed that they, like, know what they're doing and don't. Yeah. As opposed to the freshman, who it's presumed he doesn't know what he's doing, so he kind of gets this chaperone the whole night. Yeah. So you get to have the comedic uh, back and forth of, like, like here's what we do, go buy this. Because, like, at some point they send Mitch next door to go buy beer, and he gets away with it. Absolutely. Which would not happen in the 90s, but, like... No, none probably the, not. But nonetheless, like, you get to have that kind of, like, cool and interesting thing of, like... The, the, the older people putting some faith in you having some trust having to like figure things out on your own and then the him being able to do it and then the newspaper kids fucking it up love that love that now is the hazing aspect of this still there if, we sh- if this is in the 90s now <sighs> what so we paddles are very 70s paddles are very 70s what is the 90s version of hazing because when I was hazed, it was now the early 2000s. So I don't know what the 90s version of hazing was. You were early 2000s as well. That's true. Or mid to late 2000s. I mean, I, I or, didn't really you know. experience hazing until college. Yeah. And that felt... Yeah. Made yeah. Sense. I feel like it's going to be... 
So here's what happened a lot in my high school. Okay. My high school wasn't really about hazing. My high school was about pranks. But it were pr- it was pranks where people didn't get hurt. Sure. And I remember that there was like a like a couple of the teachers at my high school who were cool with it and so the kids kind of pulled pranks and did silly things for those for and to those teachers. Like there was sure. a rivalry between Mr. Mason and whoever the other guy's name was. Sure. Because I remember I was in a class one time and some kids from the other from like the other class came up, opened the door and said something and then dumped a bunch of tennis balls in our room. <laughs> and that was it. Okay. And I remember like the, the, the biggest one, the craziest one, was uh I don't remember this other teacher's name, but a bunch of kids basically once school was over and he'd gone home, went into his classroom inflated a bunch of blue balloons filled the classroom with blue balloon blue balloons and it had a paper mache loch ness monster okay so they turned his classroom into loch ness because i think he was kind of like the we Brilliant. believe a uh, bigfoot kind of guy so they they made the classroom into loch ness which was the coolest fucking That's thing ever so cool but so it wasn't hazing but it was pranks okay but again for my class for my Uh, school it was harmless pranks and i was never really involved in any of them because i was not cool right but that is what the cool kids were doing we had pranks when i was in high school and they got out of hand sure like they there were parts of the school that had to be shut down like people were putting baby oil all over the main walkway in the school like had to shut down the school there was one that got out of hand as well i think the juniors did this they went to the football field and they salted a big 20, 2006 into the middle of the field, mm. which kills all the yeah, grass and is really great. bad. And because that, so we're convinced that the juniors did it as opposed to the seniors, mm. because the consequence for that is that we didn't get to experience one of the big traditions for the senior class, which was the slip and slide day. They canceled slip and slide day because of this damage to the football field. Mm. And so it sucked and we think the juniors did it and got us in trouble. Yeah. But we don't know. No one knows. Those juniors. I hope this comes out and somebody finally confesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we'll see. Who knows? But like, that's kind of the idea of... Do you think the hazing is just forcing the freshmen to do these pranks on maybe their old teachers or the new teachers coming up? Maybe. I also think it could be something where, like, like a senior ditch day kind of thing where they go in and something's up with all of their lockers. Sure. Like, they all get pied or something like that. Because, right. like, that was certainly a thing that happened is, like, people got pied in at my school. Oh, like, I mean, we could switch out the paddles for just pie. pie. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. The, there was something There was something that got briefly mentioned in the movie that I wanted more of. Okay. After Ben Affleck finish, finishes wailing on poor Mitch, yeah. as he's walking away, he's like, I gotta get you to sign my paddle. And I think that's something that is a fun element that was missing from this movie of, yeah. okay, I got you. What prevents other seniors? Like, we understand this kid got got. He's now off limits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I like the idea of, like, then getting the kids to sign the thing. Oh, that's good. Of, like, oh, I got him. I got his signature. And so it's whoever collected the most freshmen. Oh, okay. So it is also a competition, but, okay. the, like, the kids are like... I, okay, you threw a pie at me, but unfortunately it doesn't count. I already signed so-and-so's paddle. Okay. Damn it. Ugh. I gotta get one of them. So, like, even the the three newspaper nerds could be like, well, what do we do? Well, we gotta pie someone. And every single person they pie has already been got. And it's like, ah, oh, man, everyone knows this person already got me. And Maybe like, they take their shoelaces, too. Why? Why not? <laughs> okay. It marks them. It's, you can tell if somebody's walking in shoes with no laces. It's true. That feels like it would take so long. Yeah. Well, right. they're already pied. They can't... They're not running. That's true. They can't see. They can, they're not running anymore. <laughs> They've been pied. So, uh, it's three things. Pie, shoelaces. What are they signing? That's true. Because in original Days and Confused, like, he says, sign my pa- my paddle. And I think that's actually really cool and interesting, I, but I obviously we're not going to do cool. that. But I think if we're doing your thing, instead of having it, of signing anything, it's just whoever collects the most laces. That's good. What ha- what ha- do what do they become like the king of the party? Yeah. At the end of the at the end of the, the beginning of the summer party. Yeah. I think that's great. Whoever collects the most laces doesn't buy doesn't pay for beer. Doesn't pay for beer. I like that. Yeah. Nice and simple. Yeah. And it guys and girls. 
dudes are only allowed to pie dudes. Girls are only allowed to, to pie girls. I like that. And non-binary people on the sign-up list, they get to say, well, whoever pies me, pies me. I dig it. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so they collect the laces and then like, that's the big thing they celebrate at the end of like, and the winner! Yeah! <laughs> and they get like, uh, they probably get like a crown or something. A crown made of laces. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You take the laces, you make it into a crown. Those yeah, laces aren't going they back. They weave it into a crown. That's yeah. ridiculous. I love it. <laughs> king, of the, king and queen of the summer. I love it. It's so good. Okay. So that that's our take, our modern playful take on hazing no one's sure. actually gonna get hurt but they will be inconvenienced yeah and this is something i could see parents being like yeah well okay yeah get them get em. Get, <laughs> you can pie my child yeah i'm not gonna pull there were two guns pulled this movie two guns yeah and we don't need guns no if people are just getting pied it's silly but it is texas <laughs> it is texas but it's like but like you have this moment of like i'm gonna go into your house and pie you and she's yeah. like the fuck you are yeah oh yeah. right excuse me so, so does that take away some of the urgency for those kids? I mean, do we just have a neurotic mom that doesn't want to do laundry? And that's no, her thing? because for the kid, <laughs> if the kid makes it to the party and still has their laces, mm. they also drink for free. Ooh, okay. So, okay. It's, for the seniors, it's like, all right, well, I got to get as many laces because then I get to drink for free. But for the freshmen, we're welcoming you in if you survive. If you survive. No, I dig that. I dig that. Okay. Yeah. Ah, but then how do you prove... They take the laces. They should probably mark the... They should probably mark the freshmen somehow so they know... Everyone knows. Like, the fact that everyone knew is like, we heard, Mitch, that you got pie. And everyone just, like, takes it as gospel. Mm. Okay. Like, there are enough witnesses. People see it. They're traveling in groups. People talk. It's fine. You could, you could put it in AIM. You know what we could do... Oh, you we don't even could, know what AIM is. I we don't. can put it in AOL Instant Messenger. That's great. Yeah. I was going to say we could make one of these characters like the ledger holder. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the newspaper kids. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. The newspaper kids, now the redhead. Okay. So instead of them being like following up and trying to pie kids and failing because that's dumb, let, let's do that. The newspaper kids are the ledger keepers. I love of, that. Like, they have to go around and do all of this. And so they're doing it because that's how they get to go to the party. They okay. agree to do this thankless job. Yeah. This boring spreadsheet work. So they can still they still think it's archaic and dumb, but But they get to go to the they party. They get to go to the party and drink for free. Love it. Love it. Now those are interwoven stories. Love that. Great. Okay. So Pink. I still think he can be signing the uh in his case, in our modern take, the Dare Pledge. Oh yes. <laughs> so, oh yes. Like, he has to sign the dare pledge to be eligible to play. Football's still fine. Whatever. It doesn't matter. And he doesn't want to do dare. Because dare's dumb. Dare is dumb. Does he wear the shirt, on our, like, ironically? I feel like he's going to find a Hot Topic version that says something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what it would be. Just dumb. I mean, if we're doing 90s, the kid's probably a punk. Like, yeah. Like, he probably just spray paints it himself. I mean, let's be real. What he is is grunge. True. Before oh, MTV killed it true <laughs> <laughs> that is a true thing about the history of grunge uh, this is definitely a man just completely dressed like kurt cobain then absolutely like there's no other way uh when did kurt cobain die i don't have an answer to that <laughs> 94 so five years prior this is absolutely a dude dressed like dave Grohl. <laughs> <laughs> i mean it still can be kurt cobain sure but, like, whatever. Yeah. Like, that that whole idea of... Sure, why not? Yeah. You have you have a little bit of 90s fashion, but mostly they're just wearing, like, clothes. Yeah, love it. Like, they're still self-conscious kids. They're still dressing like they are self-conscious kids. It's yeah. fine. Love that. What else do we need for the, the character named Pink? <sighs> it might be nothing. We might kind of have his arc because we don't really need to change all that much. I mean, I wrote down in his description... The puka shells. That needs to be replaced for me. It's very important. I mean, we can't give him a Tamagotchi, although one of the newspaper kids is definitely going to have a Tamagotchi. Mm. Despite the fact that that was several years prior. That's true. Uh, but no, that's stupid. That's just a stupid 90s joke. He does not need a Tamagotchi. He no, can, he he can drink Tang. It's fine. <laughs> 
No, uh, he's he's for sure got to have a chain wallet, right? That's it. Instead of having uh, the puka shell necklace, he just has a chain. <laughs> it's a chain. That's it. That's all it is. That, that's what he needs. That's Great. what he was Done. missing. <laughs> so, and then let's talk about Mitch. What yes. is Mitch's arc? Because, again, a lot of it does still work of he's the incoming freshman. He's going to get pied. Yeah. But then does he go to the party? Of course he does. But he's still going to have to. He got pied. He got pied. He gets to go to the party, but he doesn't get to drink for free. So he, he brings ha- his own beer. Which is why that to, whole... Yeah, yeah, he yeah, brings yeah. his own beer, he brings some money, whatever. Makes sense. He has, he has to get beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, he, I mean, he, do, he does in the film anyway. So, like, yeah. that, that's, there's a place for it. For a lot of kids in high school, not me, but I hear it's true, getting beer is one of the major things that is a, a mark of social status. Yeah, 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 yeah. When, you, when you're the only dude with a patchy beard and people, <laughs> you know... Look, at some point, some I'm going to be able to grow a beard. But until that day... I mean, I I was able to do it, but there's no way the dude didn't know. No. I sounded like Mickey Mouse till I was 20. Well, it's also like, <laughs> even the dude who was like dropping kegs off at fucking Pickford's house... Oh, knew yeah. Knew he was dropping off kegs to a high schooler. Yeah. And he showed up an hour and a half early... And then he had to leave, which means he lost that fucking sale. <laughs> so his wanting to go home early... Means that he probably got freaking yelled at at work. That dude probably got fired. He might have been fired. That poor guy. He fucked up. He did. He fucked up. An hour and a half early. Yeah, you don't do that. No, no. Not no, when. No. Not when. It's not been when scheduled. there's a specific drop off time that's been established. Well, that dude's. That dude lives in this town. Like, yeah, for sure. He should know. He knows what's going on. Yeah, but that's what happens. What sometimes, a shame. sometimes you're an idiot. True. What yeah? What is Mitch's new arc? I mean, I'm assuming that he's still paired with yeah. Pink I think here. he's still paired with Pink, and I still think it could be whatever he thought he was in middle school. But that's over, and kind of just like. But I think we need to be more just like we we choose you this one come with us and learn how to be high school of like mm. I think his arc needs to be more stated of like I think we can go the other way in that we are going with pink of like pink being like i don't want to treat this as the best time of my life if i look back on high school and think it's the best time of my life i'm gonna be fucking mad mitch can be someone who really really had a good time in middle school and he's terrified of high school Mm. like he doesn't want to do high school and like everything he knows is like and it starts with getting pied i'm about to go into the four years worst years of my life yeah yeah and so pink is trying to resist treating it as the best years of his life Mitch is trying to fight the fear that it's going to be the worst years of his life. Mm. You know what's interesting is the music is such a heavy thing in this movie. Oh, it is. I think it'd be interesting if both of them connect on that level somehow. Especially, I mean, just from an art point of view, somebody that has performed music for a long time. I think it'd be cool to show... If we do have Pink be this sort of mentor, and he's obviously a little bit more grunge, we're in the 90s now whatever if we have them have a bit of a connection maybe one of them plays guitar something like that in there and that's how they connect and that's how he sort of picks up on this kid sure Um, i don't know maybe they catch him and pie him when he's got a guitar on his back from band class or whatever i mean he he's playing baseball in the movie as it exists and we can certainly do that yeah but I do think that's better. Yeah. I do think coming back home from band practice or playing something of like, it's middle school graduation and yeah. they got the opportunity to play middle school graduation. Yeah, or the yeah, party yeah. afterwards or the parent reception or something. Oh, that's good. Which isn't cool, but it's a, a gig. Yeah, 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 yeah. And when he gets pied and his shoelaces get taken, it also gets on his guitar. And so Pink helps him clean off the guitar and then gives him a, li- a lift home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they start talking about music. They connect with that. Yeah. I think it's a cool little moment. Richard Linklater loves music and is good with music. And He's... I think you need to take the time and celebrate that. I think so, too. I think that's a nice little moment. So we've talked about Pink and Mitch and, like, the three nerds and kind of, like, what we have and what they are. I don't think we've necessarily taken the time and gendered any of these people. And I do think that's important. Unfortunately... Yeah. Based on the structure of the movie we've created, I do think Pink and Mitch need to either both be boys or both be girls. I think so, too. I don't really care which way we go. Mm. I cast uh, two boys. I also cast two boys. That's fine. But what I do think we need to do is I think we potentially need to have another arc 
that is specifically for women because this movie doesn't really do the women of the movie any favors. Well, I think I think we have it in Sabrina. I think we just need to bring that, which is the the freshman. Um, oh freshman yeah, yeah. Woman. I th- I think that just needs to be more of a stated thing. I think if we have it be a coming of age on two sides of of these two boys, Sabrina and one of the older uh, girls as well. We can have both of those and then still have the third story being the nerds. You know what the movie almost did but didn't do and I also thought was going to they were going to be doing mm-hmm. is everyone else we've talked about has lived in this town their whole life. Yeah. Sabrina kind of feels like a flea, free-floating agent. She doesn't yeah. have any friends. She doesn't know anybody. Yeah. She's randomly standing on her own and then gets asked if she wants to come along. Mm-hmm. And she goes, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Like, she has no impetus. She has no character. Mm. But I genuinely feel like her character could be like, her family moved to town this year. Yeah. So she can very much be the point of view character for the audience where... A lot of this stuff is just kind of happening and not being explained. Yeah. But I feel like the rules can be explained to her because she's the one who's getting all of this happen to her. Yeah. Like she can get pied and then start crying and she's like, I don't understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. And then they get mad at her because she's not wearing shoelaces. Yeah. <laughs> because like, don't you get it? You were supposed to wear shoelaces. Ugh, now I have to go get another pie. <laughs> and a bunch of people go off. And then what was uh, a Jody? Jody, yeah. Uh, Jody comes along to Sabrina and goes, "You don't have any, you're not from here." And she's like, "No, we moved to town four months ago." And she's like, "Oh, okay." And then Jody kind of is the mentor to Sabrina that Pink is to Mitch. I think that's a. I think that would be a great thing to have it on both sides of the spectrum. Yeah, these two coming of age stories, and I think I think you're absolutely right in having Sabrina being the audience's point of view to this setting. Yeah, I think that's a great way to do it. Like we just, I I don't necessarily have a problem with the way Dazed and Confused unfurled its story. No. Like yeah, yeah. it worked, I got it, it figured out. It's not complicated. Sure, sure, sure. But there's so many characters who are kind of largely nothing, and yeah. Sabrina's one of them. Yeah. And I feel like instead of giving her this romance with the uh, lighter nerd with uh, fucking Tony, Tony, thank yeah. you. Like I feel like that's something for her to do. And I think that that means that then she can bond with Mitch later and they can be like, hey, we've both been through this. We got chosen as the people who get who got shown the ropes. That's pretty cool that we were both lucky enough to get to go through this. Yeah. Also, none of the high schoolers want to talk to us now that we're at a high school party. Do you want to talk to me? Yeah. Because once they get to the party, high schoolers are not going to talk to middle schoolers. Absolutely not. And uh, they shouldn't. No. <laughs> No, that's being cut for sure. <laughs> yeah. So like, it's the all of a sudden like, hey, we're at this high school party. We brought our own beer. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah, this sucks. Let's hang out together. Yeah. No, and I think I think we're I think we're going to be okay. End of movie. Yeah. Cathartic moment. End of movie. High school's not so, not going to be so bad. How did you feel about the ending for Pink, though? I think that needs to get fixed a little i like the moment where he stands up for himself and i'm like okay cool y'all are putting a lot of emphasis on this piece of paper that everyone agrees doesn't mean shit yeah nobody cared like they've all said they all they all said this and then kept doing all the things yeah so it's like meaningless bravado yeah which is somewhat inconsistent with his character that said dare is stupid yes and i could see him not wanting to be a part of dare but and so we could just make it as simple as like Hey, part of being on the team means that you also need to be a dare representative and go into the middle school and tell kids not to do these things. And like, and he, it can be that. Ooh, I like that. And that way, when he's getting his like dare outfit, he's like, no, if you want me to, me to still play football, I'll play football, but I'm not doing that. I'm not doing this. Yeah. Like, I appreciate that you guys want to do that. And I appreciate that this is important to you specifically. Yeah. But it's not important to me. And I think this is a, a big part of growing up. Yep. Yeah. I'm not going to go in and lie to these children. Absolutely not. Except about heroin. Don't uh, don't take heroin. Don't do kids. that. <laughs> do the cool drugs, do not the really cool drugs. Yeah. <laughs> do the ones that Colorado's cool with. The rest yeah, of them yeah. stay away. <laughs> I think Colorado's cool with cocaine now. Oh boy. No, they're, I, they're cool with something. It was mushrooms. like mushrooms. That's too, that was it. Oh, okay, mushrooms. that's fine. Yeah. Kids shouldn't do mushrooms though. No. No. <laughs> High schoolers maybe. Yeah. It, I guess they're still kids. Look, they, they are. <laughs> but like, especially in Colorado, that's how you get into beaten by a bear. 
Oh, no, that's fair. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think there are places, I think there is a place and time for just about anything. Yeah. But going into the woods so you don't get caught to do mushrooms and then someone wanders off. That's fair. Yeah. No. Yeah, I'll give that to you. <laughs> I'll give that to you. Stick to weed, kids. <laughs> Stick to weed, kids. You heard it here first. That's the ideal remake slogan. <laughs> Ideal Weed Make. Ideal Weed Make? Yeah. That's a separate podcast. You can host that. Heck yeah. I'm um, in. But yeah, what else do we need story-wise? Is, well, are we cutting Wooderson? I don't know. You know what? Here's what Wooderson needs to be. Well, there's two different versions. Sure. Because we have the two different bad versions. The first version is Fred O'Banion, who failed, who takes a little bit too much delight in being an asshole to the freshman, and everyone kind of acknowledges that, like, he needs this because he has nothing else going on in his life. Right. For him, high school was the best time of his life. Right. It's, it's big, it's sad, we need a villain, something that the kids can overcome, great, fine, they did it, we move on, we never see him again. Right. Wooderson, I think, is someone who I think is, I think Pink is friends with him, mm. but I think Pink is terrified of becoming him. Because Wooderson has moved on, he has his job, he's doing whatever, and he's like, he's the cool guy, mm. but he's still just hanging out with high schoolers. And Pink's like, I don't want to, like, I don't be that. like literally, we can have the moment where like Pink's like, yeah, cool, Wooderson, whatever. He's like, he's the cool dude who's hanging out with us. Mm. When we can't get beer, he gets us beer. He hangs out, and he just he likes th- thinking himself's cool. He is cool. He hang out. We play foosball. Mm. He can even have a girlfriend. A consistent girlfriend his own age, but they just like hanging out with the high schoolers because it makes them feel cool. I, I, f- we might not be ready to get into this. I fully gender Ben Wooderson. Good. Yeah. Much better. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I think we need to address at the end of the movie, our actual end of the movie, is I think Pink, after having his big football showdown, mm. needs to have this moment where he talks about how he likes hanging out with Wooderson, but his biggest fear is becoming Wooderson. He doesn't want to be someone who looks back and idolizes his time in high school. Mm. He wants to be someone who knows that the best is yet to come. And for Wooderson, that's not true. Well, I think I think it's more than that. It's not even just... I don't think it's that Wooderson idealizes high school. I think there's... In Texas, there's this weird thing where... Especially those of us who went to college. Those who don't leave your hometown in such a big state... You kind of never do. Yeah. And it happens a lot. It does. I also know that Texas, more than anywhere else, probably anywhere, is where people will be the big fans of high school football. Yeah. People people don't There leave. is an, I, an idolization of high school in Texas specifically that doesn't oh, yeah. really exist anywhere oh, else. Oh, yeah. They're very serious about it. And so I think that is Pink's arc of recognizing that in the different people he works he he interacts with and sees and re- and realizing that that's he doesn't want to be in this town forever he loves all his friends yeah. he likes being with them but like i think that's more the thing is he doesn't want to be stuck here yeah i think that's his arc yeah i think so too and so like that can be it of just be- being like hey someday i'm gonna leave town hey man that's cool yeah at and, the en- at, at the end of this i'm gone like i've got things i want to see i got a life i want to live I and need to get out of here. If we want to end the movie on a question, it's whether or not we think that's true. Yeah. Because we can end on a bittersweet note of maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. Yeah. Like, it can end on, if he has that conversation with one of his friends, they can be like, hell yeah. If he ends on that that on that conversation with Wooderson, it's, hey man, me too. Ooh. I like that. And it's just how we feel like we want the movie to end. I think... The thing I like about this movie a lot is that it does sort of have a little bit of bittersweet to it. It's got a lot of hope yeah. in a lot of the characters. I think our characters that are full of hope are going to be... What was her name? Sabrina? Sabrina. Sabrina, Mitch. Yeah. And hell, even the, the Y2K nerds. Sure. Of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. hey, the world's going to end, but we're going to have fun while we get there. Of like, it's a little bit of hope before the end. And then for Pink, it's that bittersweet of... Maybe I will, maybe I won't. I don't know yet. You know, I think for the Y2K nerds, I think for me it would be obvious that Mike and Tony are the ones that really believe in the Y2K stuff. And she's just like, 
these are just my friends. I'm so sorry. What is what is her character? Cynthia name? Dunn. Cynthia. I think she would be smart enough to just be like, these are my friends, yeah. and I am hanging. I don't believe in any of this. I Guys, mean, we're gonna be fine. Like I, we we all had those friends in high school who we could tell like didn't necessarily buy our bullshit, but didn't want to take the time to make other friends. Yeah, absolutely. That's fair. <laughs> that's like eh, they're good enough. And I think that's absolutely what Cynthia would do. Yeah, is just be like, I don't, I don't think you. Cynthia really is the one person we know for sure <laughs> is leaving town without even saying it. Oh, without a question, she's go- she's uh, gone. Easy Ivy League. Easy. Even, even in the movie written, it was so obvious she was the smartest character in the film. Easily, easily. She very level headed. Clearly, like yeah, this like yeah, he's an idiot, but he's hot. So yeah, fuck it, why not? <laughs> of like, I'm just whatever. It's like I'm gonna do my thing, and then we'll we'll move on. Yeah, I'm gonna do fine. the things that I enjoy. I'm gonna be. The most emotionally stable of all of us. Absolutely. But yeah, so for them, you get to have that. So yeah, I think there's something reasonable in ending on that bittersweet note of this is this biggest day of the year. We're experiencing it now. This is the pinnacle. Yeah. And then just kind of like watching the sunrise and realizing that it's over. Yeah. And that's the end of the movie. Well, realizing that now there's another day. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. another day, but it, that, that whatever the next day is won't be that last be that. day of school. Yeah, absolutely. It isn't the party day. Yeah. So Ugh. it's going to be another day, but this like is the that. day that we've been looking forward to. Yeah, I like that. And we just spell it days and confused. Days and confused? <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, but yeah, okay, so that's our movie. Okay. We did different things uh, in terms of casting. Uh, yes. In terms of I scattershot, I cast a lot of people. Sure. And you cast a few people. I cast a few, yeah. Um, so I have a few people you don't have. When we get to them, I'll just tell you who I have, why I have them, and we'll move on. Rock on. Let's start with Pink. Okay. I had uh, Miles Brown from Grownish. Okay. Oh, uh, oh, no, sorry. That was somebody else. I had um, Derek La. Derek La is who I had. He's from Gen V. I'm not familiar with Derek La. How do you spell La? L-U-H. L-U-H. Okay. What why him? I for some reason I I did sort of see Pink as this kind of androgynous character. I think that's fair. And I think I, I after seeing Derek in Gen V, he plays that very well or they play that very well. I don't know if those are the correct pronouns, but they play that very well. Also just a phenom- phenomenal actor as far as like portraying being comfortable in yourself. And I think Pink is a big part of that. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. The other good thing about Derek La is that they are musicians. Yes. I don't... Here's the thing about my Pink. Okay. My Pink isn't necessarily a musician, but he's definitely a singer. Okay. Um, I went with an actor named Anthony Gonzalez. Okay. Who... He's, like, visible in Granddaddy Daycare. He's visible in The Last Ship. But he's also the voice of the kid from Coco. Yes. Okay. And so when I cast my Anthony Gonzalez, I wanted someone who was cool, but clearly not, like, the coolest kid in school. Right. Someone who, like, hang with the cool kids, but also, like, not necessarily tied to that group implicitly. Okay. Um, I'm more than happy to go with Derek La, but, yeah, that's kind of who I have in mind. I think that's a good choice, too. You know, how about we do it like this? Let's cast them in pairs as far as, like, Mitch and Pink and how we think that relationship would okay. look on screen. Great. So then let me tell you about my Mitch. Yeah. My Mitch, I cast... So, for most of my teenagers, they're, like, 21, 22, 23. Right. Uh, but for my Mitch, I went and I made sure I found someone who was, like, 15. Yes. Yeah. So, this is a kid who was in Jane the Virgin, who was in the Mindy Project... His name is Elias Jansen. Cute yeah, kid. yeah, You can yeah. see him like being like, "I'm, I'm nervous about high school. It's gonna be yeah. weird. I, I don't, I don't know how to deal with. Uh, I don't. What? I don't know. I, I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And so like, he, but like, once you get him past all that, he'll be fine. Yeah, I think so too. And so that's why I thought Elias Jansen would be a, a good pick for that. I had a similar sort of, of sort of feeling. I, I picked Ian Chen. Okay. Uh, Ian Chen has been in, like, he's been in both the Shazam movies, 
know, he's been in a lot of stuff. Dog's Journey, Wish Dragon. I, for some reason, I just saw there's a, there's kind of an innocence to his face. Sure. And I, you know, I saw a lot of that in the Mitch in the original film as well. The only reason I might potentially uh, push us towards Elias is okay. because Ian Chen is 18. Ian Chen is 18. So I would say let's do Elias Jansen and Derek La. Okay. I love that. I, I, lo- I love that. No? No, I heard what you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> so then I I cast Simone Kerr, who sort of was Pink's girlfriend, sort of not. We don't know. Okay. But like someone else in that community of like... I'm okay with them being a, yeah, maybe we're an item, maybe not. We, we don't want to put a label on it. Right. This is an actress who I saw in Jojo Rabbit, and she's brilliant in that. She's also in Last Night in Soho and The Power of the Dog. But, like, in Jojo Rabbit, she's phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, her name is Thomasine McKenzie. And I know you don't have someone for this role, but, like, she's very, very good. Oh, I do recognize her. Oh, yeah, she's brilliant. Cool. So then I think our next two that we should cast are Dawn and Fred. Our two lunkheads. Yeah. But the the lunkhead who is kind of malign and the lunkhead who is caustic. Yes. Let's start with the malign. Um, Let's start with Dawn Dawson. The one who's like, he's the footballer. He signed the pledge. But like, whatever, man. I'm just kind of here for the party. I'm just here to have a good time. Okay. Who did you have? I went with (laughs) Karen Brar. K-A-R-A-N-B-R-A-R. He was in Diary of the Wimpy Kid. He was in Jesse. He's in Star Girl. He's like Disney School of uh, Kids. And, I don't know, just kind of, uh, I didn't want to typecast anybody because it's like, yeah, I'm casting you as a lunkhead. Hey. This is one of the kids who, like, he is a little bit older, but, like, presumably that means that, like, he got his growth spurt first. He, like, I think this one's, like, 24 or 25. He was Cadet Suresh in Pacific Rim Uprising. And... I actually like that choice better than mine. Oh, yeah? Who'd you have? I had Lyon Williams. For some reason, I'm not really able to pull them up. It should be L-Y-O-N Williams. No, I love that choice, because that he has played kind of a goofy character before. Yeah. I mean, no, that's perfect. Cool. Then, who did you have for Fred O'Banion, the fifth year, who flunked out of senior year and has to take the class over again? I had Nichols, uh, Nicholas Hamilton. Tell me about Nicholas Hamilton. Nicholas Hamilton, I mean, you'll pick up what I'm putting down immediately. Nicholas Hamilton is, I believe he's also worked on Gen V. Yeah. He, he's just... Was he the kid from It? He's definitely in It. He's definitely in It, Captain Fantastic. Man, and he looks like just a straight up adult. He does. Because he's 24. Like, he is the right age for what we're doing. Exactly. And he's supposed to look like an adult. He looks a little bit older, but also for some reason, every time I think of Ben Affleck, I just think, like, chiseled chiseled jaw and intense eyebrow. That's fair. That's (laughs) what he's got. It's just, it's to a T for me. That's fair. I I don't know why. The person I had for this was, (laughs) he's most famously known... For being Carl Grimes on The Walking Dead. He's the kid from The Walking Dead. Yes. I went with Chandler Riggs. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Because, like, I didn't know it, but certainly it was Ben Affleck. Pretty big. I mean, he wasn't famous at the time, but it's Ben Affleck. Right, yeah. So I'm going with someone who's kind of, like, famous at the time. He's like, he's the kid from The Walking Dead. If anyone's going to have if anyone's gonna have a chip on the shoulder, it's the kid from The Walking Dead. That's very true. <laughs> I, I think he's got the the sort of look for it, too. I've seen him play angry. I've seen him in the show. Yeah. <laughs> I th- you know, I think that's brilliant. I'm more than happy to go with Nicholas Hamilton, though. I yeah. have no strong preference about this. I, I, th- I think I would probably cast Nicholton, Nichol- Nicholas Hamilton before Chandler, but but not by much. I think, that's it would fair. Be, I think it would be tough in the casting, for sure. It's all about the, uh, the vibe we get in their read. Yeah. And uh, if, they, if they're if they the sort of people who'd hang. Yeah. I think it would be close. Yeah. They're, they're both great. I yeah. love Chandler. Um, okay. So then that brings us to Pickford. Yes. Now, Pickford, that's where I cast Miles Brown. Okay. Is this where you cast Miles Brown? This is where I cast Miles Brown. <laughs> Hell yeah! <laughs> oh, that's dope. You know, from Boy Genius, from Blackish, from Monster High, Miles Brown. Yes. He's the sort of kid who's like, I'm going to have a party at my house. No, you're not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> I was like, as soon as you said that, I was like, uh-oh. And then you're like, no, he's going to be coming later. I was like, 
Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. I love when that happens. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I pulled up a solid list of, like, people in this age range, but, like, there's not a lot of kids to pull from. No. But we did a good job. I think so. And good for us, Miles Brown. That So the next two are two that I have that you don't, and then we'll follow those up with Slater and Sabrina. Okay. So Jody Kramer, the sister. Yes. Um, I wanted someone who was also Hispanic. Mm-hmm. She, a little bit older, uh, she was just in West Side Story. She was in Shazam. She's in Ballad of Songbird and Snakes. I went with Rachel Ziegler. Oh, that's great. Oh, she's brilliant. She's the older sister who'd be looking after her little brother in a way that is, in fact, bad for the little brother. She's brilliant. She's stunning. I think she'd be great in that role. Yeah. Uh, And then for Mike Newhouse, the the eyebrow nerd. Yes. I went went with uh, Gatton Matarazzo from Stranger Things. If you're going to have a paranoid nerd, have the paranoid nerd who is now high school age. Yep. Slash older than high school. He is now a proper adult. The Stranger Things kids are adults now, and I need people to know that. <laughs> but who did you have for Slater, the, the drugged up kid? Slater, I had Lucas Hedges. Oh, okay. Uh, from Manchester by the Sea. Okay. Why Lucas Hedges? I, one, I love Manchester by the Sea. There's just something to his look. I think it would be really fun for him to play that sort of stoned out character throughout the whole picture. I, th- I think of him as a little bit... I think he would just have fun with it. He's certainly the oldest of everyone we've cast so far, but that's fine. He does... He, he is a little bit older. He is 27. Sure. It's not the end of the world. No. For something, like, for something like this, it's not the end of the world. I like. I personally think he has a bit of a youthful look to him. Um... But, like, and, and you, I, I have no say. Sure. Like, we're going with him because I have no, no one for this role. Sure. But, like, yeah. Like, you think you, you think you can get this guy, this dude high? This uh, military-looking dude? I think so. I, I, to be fair, especially him with a crew cut. Like, him, not necessarily with a crew cut, but him bald with that hat on. For some reason, I just see... Him in his sort of skinny frame. Oh, you want him to be bald, not super long hair? No, I think he'd be great bald, just same, still with the hat, lanky, here's stoner. What, no, here's what, we're, <laughs> here's what we're actually going to do. That's very funny, but we can do better. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to spend the entire movie thinking he's bald. Okay. He's going to be wearing the hat, we're going to think he's bald the entire movie. Okay. And then finally he's going to take the hat off and turn around, and we're going to realize that he shaved a weed plant into the back of his head. It's so much better. It's so much better... I actually love that. Okay. <laughs> Weed hat Lucas Hedges. Weed hat Lucas Hedges. Who'd you have for Sabrina? Sabrina, I had Peyton Elizabeth Lee from Shameless. Okay. I think... How old is she? If she's in her 20s, then we got a problem. I don't think so. She is exactly 20. Oof. That is probably a little bit too old. Yeah. I don't have anyone else for this because obviously you cast this character and I did not. So we will go with her. That's fair. For you know, this character, that is too old. It is too old. I, ca- but, I cast her based on my memory from Shameless. Obviously yeah. she played a younger character in Shameless and it doesn't work now. But I, I think that that sort of coming of age story, that a person that's sort of setting into themselves... I had seen that from her. Yeah. And seen it done brilliantly from her. We'll say a Peyton Elizabeth Lee type. Yes. Yeah. Because the one thing that was important about this movie is that the the freshman looked younger than everyone else. Yes. And that is important for this. Like, it doesn't... They, they shouldn't just blend in. No. Yeah. Okay. That brings us to Tony Olson, the paler complexion nerd. Yes. I... Went with someone who does not have a pale complexion. He is the kid from the Jungle Book. I went with Neil Sethi. Fantastic. I, we no. know he's a good actor. We know he can do a lot with a little. Yeah. And he is a, he's a good actor. And yeah. like, let's put him in high school. Let's see what happens. Great facial physicality in his roles. I think that's, I think that's a great choice. Yeah. You know, Vish from All You Need Is Blood. Yeah. <laughs> Let's give him something where he gets... Like, in the same thing that we did for Lucas Hedges, in that let's give him something that is a different kind of character. Yeah. Dude with range. Let's see what happens. Who did you have? I went with a Stranger Things actor on this one, and I put Noah Schnapp. Okay. 
We cannot go with Noah Schnapp, unfortunately. No? What was the exact line that I learned? So in Metropolis, we were considering Noah Schnapp for a, a line, and then my friend Tanner let me know that, surprise, this wasn't mentioned in the episode, but glad y'all didn't go with Noah Schnapp in Metropolis, because that's the kid who's handing out Zionism and se- is sexy stickers. Oh, good. Good so, shit. Yeah, so... Uh, so didn't we know that. Thank you for that. I didn't know that either until literally today. Okay. Because Tanner was on top of it and is a good friend and they listened to my Metropolis. By the way, my episode 150 came out today, day of recording. But, so we can't go with Noah Schnapp. So, Neil Sethi it is. Oh, man. Yeah, that is a, that is a, that is a dumb child. Holy hell. Who is now an adult. All the kids on Stranger Things are adults now. Look it up. Well, that's disgusting. Yeah. Sorry. Rats. Okay. So... Uh, I got Cynthia Dunn and Darla Parks, the redhead, and then the Parker Posey character. Yes. Because Parker Posey's in this movie. We didn't mention her once, but she's in this movie. She is. And she's just kind of like the obnoxious freshman, or the obnoxious senior girl. And you're just like, okay. Yeah. She's kind of the female equivalent of Fred O'Banion. Yeah, kind of. Kind of mean girl-esque a little yeah. bit. So for Cynthia Dunn, I went with a girl who was in something called Chicken Girl. She was in The Rookie. Her name is uh, Dylan Conrique. Okay. Or Conrique. Sure. I don't know her. She just seemed like a good actress. She seemed like the right age. She seemed to have uh, her shit together, which is important for this character in particular. Oh, yeah. And then for uh, Darla Marks, I needed a Parker Posey character. Mm -hmm. So we need a character who we know would be able to kick someone's ass. And so that's because this is young Electra from Daredevil. She's also in Chicken Girls. Her name is Lily Chi. All right. I see it. That's how I, who we had for those two. Groovy. And that brings us to Wooderson, the uh, all right, all right, all right, Matthew McConaughey character who you gender swapped. I did gender swap. So I'm going to tell you about who I have, and then you tell me about who you have, because we will probably go with your person. Okay. I, I cast Archie from yeah. Riverdale. Uh, I cast KJ Appa. Sure. Of like, he's a little bit older now, but I can see that's being the sort of person who's like, yeah, I'm cool. I'm hanging out with high schoolers, but like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, this is, I'm giving off the same sort of vibe that Matthew McConaughey, like a more modern interpretation of that sort of character of like, yeah, I'm cool. It's fine if I hang out with these kids. It's fine. They look up to me. I'm this kind of character. It's fine. I would never, but it's cool that I hang out here. Yeah. I, I, Wooderson's creepiness. Yes. Is, is bad. I agree. I think showing that that creepiness is there and wanting those characters to avoid becoming like Wooderson is important. Yes. So I wanted to gender swap it to an actor I know can do unsettling. Great. Where, sure. Well, and can do kind of off vibes really well. Sure. So I chose Mia Goth. Okay. Who is from X, Pearl, um, which is two of my favorite personal horror movies. She just does the creepy well. Not always in a horror sense, but in a sense of, like, unsettling, can push. So what do you want to be unsettling? So this is going to be a very yeah. different take on the character. What do you want to be unsettling about this character? How do you want this character to behave? I mean, I think this is a character that's smoking weed and drinking with high schoolers. That Somebody isn't that- inherently pearl or x level creepy that's a different kind of creepy it is a different kind of creepy absolutely but i think it's still in a way unsettling i think she maybe she's still kind of being flirty with high school football players yeah which is kind of weird yeah and off and and obviously the football players will be into it yeah and i think that being called out by I don't know, somebody like Sabrina or Mitch's... Uh, Jody. Or Jody. Or even even Pink calling that out and being uncomfortable with I it. I mean, you can even have it be as simple as she's hanging out with all the kids and they're like, yeah, she's cool. Like, obviously, like, she's cool. She'll buy us beer or whatever. But, like, why is she here? Yeah. Why is she with us? Yeah. Like, it is something that certainly kids today are... I don't think a Fonz could exist today. No. Kids today are so conscious and aware of like you're not one of us exactly and i like even in the 90s like we were conscious of that yeah of like i don't no yeah like i'm like it's cool like you can hang out with us but you're not one of us the thing is is i don't even think a male wooderson would have come close to a friendship with 
any of these people. No. At any point in time, period. But it's different when it's a hot chick. I mean... It is, though. It, I, it kind of is, though. <laughs> yeah. It's I like, mean, if she's... I, I feel like it, it just simply is. And it's it's fundamentally less creepy. Like, it is still creepy, yeah. but it's less creepy. Yeah. And like, we don't know what's going on in her life. We don't know what's wrong with her. But clearly, she's decided that in order to feel good about herself, she needs to hang out with young kids. Yeah. And that's not okay. It's not okay. And to be fair, she's maybe 23, 24... It's still not okay. It's still not okay. But it's a thing that's happening. It's a thing that's happening. But like I said, I, I don't think that for me, a male Wooderson, I don't think would even, we We can't do that anymore. It, I don't think it would even happen. In, in It would. Maybe, but definitely not to the extent that he exists. He, he certainly, like, it would exist, but like, it'd be this person connected to one of them. Yeah. And, so, so the boy, the has a partner thing yeah 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 yeah. but it's i think your interpretation of wooderson works Mm. because i think we can absolutely treat it as mia goth was the most popular girl in her grade yeah the entire like fresh freshman year through senior year Mm -hmm. she kept her shoelaces she drank she's always she always drank for free and like, she never left the town that she grew up she in. She never left the town she grew up in, but also she was the coolest kid in high school. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to let go of the crown. Yeah. And that's exactly it. Yeah. She never let go of the crown. Mm-hmm. She still considers herself the coolest kid in high school, despite the fact that she hasn't been in high school for six or seven years. Yeah, exactly. I think that's great. Mia Goth is wonderful. Um, okay, that's our cast. Mm. Let's talk about writer and director. I'm happy to go... Why don't you go first for writer and then I'll go first for director? Unless you don't have them in this case. I I actually don't have them. Okay, great. So I was going to do that because I was hoping you would take director, but that's fine. Oh. Um, My writers, I went very simple, very one for one. Mm. We know they can do this. It's a writing team. Mm -hmm. I went with the writing team behind 80 for Brady and also Blackish and most importantly, Booksmart. I went with Sarah Haskins and Emily Halpern. Okay. I think I would have a director based on that answer. Cool. My director, because we know how much he likes doing these things and respecting the movement forward in time, is like, there's really no reason Richard Linklater still can't direct this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He's still, like, this is exactly in his wheelhouse. It's still the movies he's making. He's still, he's still in touch with the youth. But, like, I think he still would be interested in, like, having a script and then letting the kids do their own interpretation and, and iterations on the script. And, like, mm-hmm. getting to be have the kids be comfortable and do what they do mm-hmm. in their town. Yeah. And I think Richard Linklater would be cool at that. That said, who's this person that you just thought of? Bo Burnham. Oh, okay. Yeah. Tell me why. Well, I think... Did, did you see his movie Eighth Grade? I didn't. It... I mean, he does coming of age he he does and he does it very well and the awkward nuances with it i think he does very well i think i don't know for for some reason you bringing up book smart for me went oh yeah kind of some humor to it yeah some awkward situations that's exactly what this movie is and my brain immediately went oh bo burnham great let's yeah. do it i'm done Perfect. easily that is our days and confused Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Pink is going to be played by Derek La. Simone Kerr will be Thomasine McKenzie. Don Dawson will be Karen Brar. Fred O'Banion will be Nicholas Hamilton. Pickford will be Miles Brown. Slater will be Lucas Hedges. Sabrina will be a, a Peyton Elizabeth Lee type. Mitch Kramer will be Elias Jansen. Jody Kramer will be Rachel, Z- Rachel Ziegler. Mike Newhouse will be Gaten Matatarazzo. Tony Olson will be Neil Sethi. Cynthia Dunn will be Dylan... Conrique. Darla Marks will be Lily Chi. David Wooderson will be Mia Goth. All of this will be written by Sarah Haskins and Emily Halpern, and then directed by Bo Burnham. That is Dazed and Confused. <laughs> Ray, you gonna go see this movie? Oh, absolutely. I'm gonna go see this movie. You're gonna go back to Austin and watch it in the theater surrounded by... A uh, thousand percent. Uh, cool. I'm gonna do it in a drive-in in Austin. Yeah, yeah. that's the way to see this. <laughs> um, awesome. Ray, thank you so much for being a guest on my podcast. This yeah. was awesome. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And so now is the time. If you have any plugs or social medias that you want people to follow or just things you want people to do, 
Tell them about it. Yeah, I am uh, Ray Boy on Instagram. You can follow me there if you ever want to. How are you spelling boy? R A Y E B O I. Great. Yeah, because I'm ridiculous. And then it's uh, <laughs> Rayman on Twitter. Feel free to at me if you want to talk films. It's what I do basically every day. And then I've got a short film coming out. I'm going to be going to festivals soon. It's in post-production right now called The Unachievable Sound of Silence. So I was the director for uh, director of uh, cinematography on that. Yeah. Uh, cool. Great. That's awesome. I look forward to seeing that whenever you do a little screening of it because I want to watch it. That sounds fun. Absolutely. If you want to follow me, I am on Blue Sky at Sam Gash, S-A-M-G-A-S-C-H. Or you can follow the podcast slash me on Instagram at Ideal Remake. Or if you want to talk about movies beyond talking about it with Ray, you can join the Dueling Genre Discord and talk to me there. That would be dope. I love talking to people on the Discord. It's great. But we will end this episode the same way we end every episode. Ray. What is your favorite quote from the movie, Dazed and Confused? All right, all right, all right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah.